Yeah, welcome to Numerical Methods. And we will soon have a new chapter where we discuss the time discretization of stochastic processes. And before we do this, yeah, I would like to discuss how you would apply the Monte Carlo method to a time discrete uh, stochastic process. So uh, creating the link between what we have done so far, yeah, so we have discussed the Monte Carlo method, random number generation, and this new chapter, the time discretization of stochastic processes. So this will be concerned with ETO stochastic processes. So what's that? So this guy here is, if you have an ETO stochastic process, it tells you that the infinitesimal change you know, of this uh, family of random variables parametrized by time yeah, uh, is given by, and then you have maybe some coefficients here, say like that, uh, a, a drift part and then a diffusion part. Yeah, then the time discretization of the stochastic process just means that you go from the infinitesimal changes to the discrete versions. So that means a delta x, so which is observed at a discrete time ti, yeah, so which is just maybe x of ti plus one minus x of ti. So this is given by, yeah, you need to evaluate the drift at maybe a fixed point multiply with the time step and evaluate the diffusion at a fixed time and multiply with the Brownian increment here. So that would be WTI plus one minus WTI. Um, of course, if I write it like that, um, I made an approximation, yeah, uh, I'm doing some kind of piecewise constant approximation. And in that case, uh, what we what we get as a result is no longer the original process, it's an approximation. So maybe I should name this guy here uh, with a different uh, symbol. So the X that we get is um, an approximation. And then I have a time discrete family yeah, of um, random variables. Yeah? So you can move this guy here to the other side and you actually have a rule how you construct the x tilde at certain times yeah next time is previous time plus some increment so you can create a time discrete family so a discrete family of random variables so actually a vector of random variables and this is what i would like to discuss today uh, the monte carlo simulation of time discrete stochastic processes and I also have another example, yeah, which is not a time discrete stochastic process, the Poisson process, but which also proceeds, uh, say, in discrete time steps in a certain sense, in random times. And it's now interesting to see the two things. Yeah, my first example, which I would like to discuss, is the Monte Carlo simulation of time discrete ETO processes. And I like to discuss it um, with an example. So we consider the valuation of an Asian option. So this is my financial product. Under the Black Scholes model. So this is my model. So what's that? Yeah, first let's turn to the product. So you know the value of a financial product can be expressed as an expectation. So that's why Monte Carlo integration is here around. And um, the, this is the expectation of a future value of the product. So this is here my V of uh, capital T uh, multiplied with the discount factor the ratio of the numeraire, and then you take the, the expectation. And what we looked at was, for example, a European option. Yeah, where you know that the payoff at 
the maturity at capital T is just given by function maximum of the stock value minus some strike K and zero. So you have a function of a random variable and then that S, that random variable, the future value of the stock was expressed uh, by your model, maybe as a function of a normal distributed random variable. And then you just have the expectation of a single random variable and you could apply Monte Carlo method, Monte Carlo integration. However, the payoff may look also a little bit more complicated. So for example, for an Asian option, the payoff is like that. There's still um, a maturity, a capital T. But what we pay is the difference of the average of the values of the stock observed up to time, capital T, and the strike and that uh, um, you know, float at zero, so the maximum of some average, one divided by M, the sum of S of Ti uh, minus K. <laughs> so I need to observe the stock value, which is uh, generated by my model. I need to observe that at different times, uh, different time steps. So the Asian option comes here with the averaging times specified. Yeah. So for example, every year, yeah, uh, until year number five. So this means the payoff depends not on a single random variable. It depends on a vector of random variables. So this is here your vector x, yeah, s of t1, s of t2, s of tm where this vector actually now represents the time evolution of the stock. So I have here different uh, time steps from T0 to T1, from T1 to T2, and so on. So these are here my uh, time steps. So you see that your problem becomes very quickly high dimensional. Yeah? So uh, here in this case, I have a vector of one, two, three, four, five, six elements. Yeah? So it's six dimensional because I have six time steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. So my Asian option depends on six observations of the stock values and I have to generate these. So what we are left is that we apply the expectation to a function of the random variable x, yeah, where the random variable x is already a vector. Yeah? So we are arriving at an m-dimensional Monte Carlo integral. And the dimension is coming from the number of time steps. So how do we generate now the stock values? Yeah, I assume a model. So this is now my model. The random variables S may be defined through a model, which gives now every STJ as a function of a possible even higher dimensional random vector. Now that depends a little bit on the model. Yeah? You could have a model with stochastic volatility where actually two Brownian motions to drivers yeah, drive uh, the stock value. Let's consider a simple model. Let's consider the Black Scholz model. So the Black Scholz model is here. DS is mu s dt plus sigma s uh, dw. dw is the Brownian motion. So an increment uh, w of uh, ti plus one minus w of ti yeah, is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation square root of the time step size. Yeah, if I would like to get uh, out of this specification, the s at specific values, well, uh, I can may yeah, I integrate this SDE, I can solve this SDE. So I do not need a time discretization scheme that approximates this SDE using discrete time steps. So actually I can derive the 
solution. And how do you do this? So the first step is to apply Ito's lemma and move to the logarithm of S. So I make coordinate transformation. So if you look here, you see that ds divided by S, this is just mu dt plus sigma dw. Mu and sigma are constant. So on the right-hand side, you have constant coefficients. So I can explicitly integrate it if I move to the logarithm, because this here is almost the derivative of the logarithm. Yeah? You know, f prime divided by f yeah, is the, if for a classical function in classical calculus, is the derivative of logarithm of f. Yeah, if you apply Ito's lemma, yeah, we get uh, that the derivative, yeah, the differential of the logarithm of s is mu minus one half sigma squared dt plus sigma dw. So almost everything you would expect from classical calculus, except that there's this term here, minus one half sigma squared. Okay, I assume you know Ito's lemma and you know where this comes from. Well, if you don't know it, or even if you know it, but there is a nice intuition to understand why this guy is there. And this guy comes from this diffusion part here. So assume for a moment that uh, this part here is not there. Then what's written there, it tells you the change of the stock is sigma times s times a random number. So the change of the stock is proportional to s. So this is like a percentage change. Assume the stock is at 100. Then here you have 100 multiplied with sigma times uh, dw. So um, if sigma times dw is, for example, 10%, yeah, I will move 10% up. Yeah? So uh, uh, 100 moves to 110. If Sigma times dw is, say, minus 10%, I move 10% uh, down. Yeah? So um, sigma s dw would be a 90 if I start at 100. So now if you have these percentage, these random percentage change, the following happens. Assume that sigma is 10%. Yeah? We move 10% up or 10% down. And now for the dw, it's a normal distributed random variable with mean zero. And say we have a time step of one, yeah, then the standard deviation is one. Yeah. Um, so we move uh, maybe one up, one down. Just assume that it's binomial. We move one up and one down with equal probability. So you have that you move from 100 to 110, or you move from... Um, 100 to 90, yeah, 10% up, 10% down. But now if you repeat this, 10% yeah? up and you go back 10% down, 100 to 110, 10% yeah? of 110 is 11, goes to 99. Also, if you move down 100, 10% down goes to 90, 10% up, 10% of 90 is nine, you go to 99. So, if you picture this, say you move up and down, or down and up, yeah? and it's always, say, multiply with 10%, you see that you go from 100 to 99, so you go 1% down. Yeah? So 1% is 10% of 10%, so sigma squared, and we move 1% down if we make two time steps. So one half sigma squared. Huh? So minus one half sigma squared. So this is just reflecting that this model that has here a percentage change with equal probability will induce a drift that is going down. So then we have the differential of the logarithm from Ito's lemma. Nice thing is that on the right-hand side, now I have constant coefficients, so I can just integrate. Yeah? And now if I 
do what we did here on on top. Huh? So I integrate from TI to TI plus one. I know that the logarithm of S at TI plus one minus the logarithm of S at TI is the integral of this right-hand side. So move the logarithm of TI to the other side. And I have a rule that creates S at a later time step from S at a previous time step. This is just logarithm of S of TI plus one is equal to logarithm of S of TI plus, yeah, integrate the guy with constant coefficients, which is our drift times the time step size plus sigma times the Brownian increment. And yeah, my Brownian increment is just a norm distributed with mean zero and standard deviation square root of delta ti, the time step size. So this is my delta ti. Yeah, now you have that the s's are a function of some other random variable where we could call these Brownian increments now delta w ti. Yeah, we could call them just square root of time step size times zi. So these guys are now square root of time step size times zi. And then I can express all the s's as functions of these zi's and the zi's are now standard normals. Okay, so now we put everything together. Yeah. The S's are a function of a vector of standard normals. So how many standard normals do we need? We need as many as we have time steps. And going back to my financial product, yeah, we see that the payoff of the Asian option yeah, is then a function of, yeah, so this function here of these assets, S, stock values. So summary, I have the vector of uh, stocks that can be expressed as a function of these IID random variables, yeah, which are standard normals. And now my standard normals, they can be expressed using the inversion of the distribution function method as a function of uniforms. And now I can create the high dimensional, yeah, the M dimensional, uh, Monte Carlo integral. So the expectation of the Asian option is now an M dimension uh, Monte Carlo integral. Maybe you can have a look at code that now values an Asian option under the Black Scholes model. So we have some code here in our lecture repository. You find this in Monte Carlo. Ito process. And that's now the Black Scholes Asian option experiment. Let's define the, some parameters. Yeah, actually, parameters which I used also before in my experiment on the important sampling. So these are my model parameters. Initial value of the stock is 100. The R parameter is 5%. The volatility is 30%. So 30% up or down. Yeah. Um, then we need these times for the averaging of the Asian option. So here come my product parameters. So this is the first year, the second year, up to five years. The option maturity. Yeah. So when we take the discount factor, the N, the option strike, the K, these are now my product parameters for the Asian option. And then I have some parameters for my Monte Carlo integration. So I have a random number generator seed and uh, the number of samples is here 10,000. Okay, so what are we doing? Yeah, these uh, fields here are members. Yeah? And so I instantiate this class yeah? and then call the method run. And the method run generates now my random number generator and calls with this random number generator the function get value agent option. Okay, and that's the actually code that you see here. So I like to calculate my Monte Carlo integral 
my Monte Carlo approximation is average all the values that we observe. So I initialize a variable sum for my summation and I loop over all samples. So these here are my samples omega, omega j. Now I'm inside, yeah, I have to value on that sample pass the Asian option. So how many time steps do we have? So the time steps is actually the length here of this array. So I only generate these times. Yeah? So this is the number of time steps. I have to average the value of the stock. So now comes the inner loop that is calculating this average here for a fixed omega. Okay, so I initialize the sum of the stock values to zero and I will loop over all uh, time steps. Yeah, my initial time is zero and my initial value of the stock is the initial value of the stock. So this is S of T zero. So now out of S of T zero, I generate the next S at the next time step. So going back here, we are now implementing this rule here. Yeah? So generate now first your normal distributed increment and then calculate the S out of the previous S. Yeah? So the normal distributed increment, we draw a uniform from our random number generator. We transform it to a standard normal. Yeah? The next time we fetch it from our array, it's times for averaging with the current index from the loop. The time step size is the next time minus, minus the current time. The current time was initialized to, to zero. So the value of the stock at the next time, and this is now here our, our model, the line here below. This is the value of the stock at the previous time. Yeah? Multiplied with exponential RT minus one half sigma squared T, yeah, delta T, uh, the time step, plus sigma square root of delta T times the standard normal. Okay, so update the time. We moved one time further and sum the values of the stock. Yeah, so go back here and calculate this, this inner sum. Yeah, we need the average of these values of the stock. Yeah, so divide the sum by the number of time steps and then calculate the payoff. So now we are back here and we calculate this maximum function of the average minus strike and zero. Okay, we discount with the discount factor. So this is multiply here with this, this part yeah, and then we, we are done. Yeah, so that is the payoff which we are averaging. You can run this experiment, okay, 8.43. So what is the dimension of the Monte Carlo integral? Yeah, maybe recall that we had this session where I did Monte Carlo method using acceptance rejection to sample the normal distribution. Yeah, where was that? That was here a random number experiment normal distribution with acceptance rejection. And there were different versions, a 3D version and a 2D version. Okay, and if you look at the 3D version, actually here is the loop over all sample paths. And you see that inside the 3D version, we actually call, regardless from now applying acceptance rejection, we call Mersen Twister three times, yeah? one for the U, one for the V, one for the sign. Yeah? And in the 2D version, yeah, we just call it uh, two times. So if you want to look what is the dimension, you just look inside this loop here, how often do you fetch your uniform random number? And uh, you just fetch it as often as the number of time steps. So you see from this implementation that the dimension is the number of time steps. Um, actually, I don't like this implementation so much because this implementation would be wrong if you use a different random number generator. For example, if you use uh, the Van der Korput secret sequence, 
So let's use random number Fanda generator Fanda corput. Let's use here the Fanda corput sequence with base two. And I calculate now the value using the Fanta corpus sequence. I could also just call this method random number generator 1D. I, I could also just call it. But you see, you get a completely unreasonable result here. Yeah, so actually this result is wrong. Yeah, because actually the Fanta corpus sequence cannot be used to generate a higher dimensional vector, yeah? You cannot use this method. So you cannot use this algorithm to create a vector out of a one-dimensional sequence, yeah? For this, what you have to do is to use a high-dimensional uh, or an appropriate dimensional low discrepancy sequence. So I prepared here a other version of this experiment, yeah, where in addition to what I have just done with you, yeah, I have a slightly modified implementation that just takes a random number generator that provides random numbers in D dimension. And now you see what I do is I loop over all sample paths. I fetch a vector of uniforms and then I transform the ice element or the chase element of this vector of uniforms to a standard normal. So I couldn't convert this vector of uniforms to a vector of standard normals. So you see now the fetching of the random vector has moved out of this loop and you clearly see the uh, di dimension. So just a very small modification. This line here was previously the line where we we're asking for the random number, yeah, and now I just moved here the generation of the uniform random vector out. This code can be used with a low discrepancy sequences. For example, we can use it with a Horton sequence, but then the Horton sequence needs to have the appropriate dimension. So here we have five time steps. So I need a five dimensional vector at least, yeah. So for that, uh, the Horton sequence should have five different bases. All the bases are co-primes. Yeah? So here I have just five prime numbers. And if you run this version of the experiment, yeah, which I will check in, you see that you get with the Horton sequence the really the same or similar result as with the Mercer Twister. And here you see very nicely that what you need is a, in this case, five-dimensional vector. Yeah, so remark, um, the Monte Carlo simulation of these stochastic processes is uh, inherently high-dimensional. Yeah, why? Because the time steps translate, yeah, number of time steps translates in, into the dimension yeah, of the Monte Carlo integral. And now consider the case where you have a very fine time stepping, yeah, for example, every month yeah, for nine or 10 years, yeah, you have 120 time steps. So you get a high dimensional random, random vector here. Yeah? Oh, for example, if you use 100 time discretization steps, you have a 100 dimensional integration. This links very nicely to what we did in our assignment because the assignment was about look at Monte Carlo integration in higher dimensions and compare it to classical integrations. And now you see that uh, 8 or 16 or whatever dimensions uh, are, is, is, is already a small number. Yeah? You can have much higher values. So code session calculate the value of the Asian option. Yeah, we did this. This can be looked up here in the Black Scholes Asian Option Experiment in this package. Okay, small illustration how the Monte Carlo integration looks here for the valuation of the Asian option. Okay, not very long code, yeah, but now you have an inner loop that 
creates these these time steps.